Okay, so our next speaker today is Jonathan Eastgate from Simpro. So I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Hello. Can you hear me, John? Yes, I can hear you. You're good to go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies if I seem a little bit... Uh, uh, out of sorts. It's uh, quarter past three in the morning here in Brisbane, Australia, uh, and it's still, uh, you know, 28 degrees Celsius. So very interesting uh, sort of summer evening for us. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through a little bit about the journey uh, myself and my company have been on uh, with FreeBSD over the last uh, coming on eight or nine years now. Uh, really looking forward to presenting this. I'm sure people will get a lot out of it. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, then we'll kick off. Okay, just checking you can see my screen. Okay, so kicking off, uh, I'll give you a little bit of history about me uh, and our business. So, uh, I uh, originally started uh, my career in IT as a founder of an ISP here in Australia uh, and was a system administrator in a number of ISPs, including uh, the ones I founded. I uh, started mainly in the Slackware 1.0 Linux world, uh, received those, uh, those, those uh, or that operating system on floppy disk from the US back in, I'm trying to remember now, but I believe it was 1995. Uh, and all of the ISPs that, uh, that we were running at the time were running on a Slackware, either 1.0 or 2.0 system. Uh, I had a brief date uh, in the sort of mid 90s with Caldera Open Linux, but unfortunately it didn't last very long uh, because then I discovered FreeBSD. Uh, so FreeBSD uh, I've been using since version 3.0 and that was in 1998 that, uh, that I made that first switch. And the switch to FreeBSD at that time, uh, some of you may or may not be aware, was very popular, particularly in the ISP space. So where, where the issues we had at an ISP level were, were running very large mail servers, authentication servers, and usually some sort of squid proxy to try and reduce our bandwidth usage. Uh, and all of those items created for us both a, a virtual memory issue and also a, a hellish sort of IO environment. Uh, and at the time, uh, you know, whilst uh, Linux was sort of the go-to in this space, FreeBSD very quickly became popular because of, because of its handling of virtual memory first up, but also the way uh, it handled high IO loads. So for example, for us, the same piece of hardware in the ISP game that might've been running a, uh, a mail server handling uh, 3000 emails a minute, um, under Linux, you know, that was a maxed out machine. Potentially you could not get a terminal session up and running on it. Uh, with FreeBSD, it, it made a massive difference to what we we're doing at the time. So that was my first journey into the FreeBSD world. And then I guess over the course of the next sort of 10 to 15 years in various roles uh, at, at various companies, I used a combination of Linux and Free, uh, FreeBSD uh, and you know, often return to FreeBSD when we got into issues. Uh, but I'm not emotional about tech choices too. So I should say, whilst I am going to sing the praises of FreeBSD today um, and, and how we're using it at Simpro, uh, a lot of the decision-making process around operating systems for me has always been about best fit um, and bang for buck. So uh, you will see, you know, lots of positive uh, insight from our use of FreeBSD, but again, I stress, you know, uh, all operating systems have their place in the world, depending on what you're trying to do with them. So the company I work for, Simpro, uh, we provide a SaaS software solution that addresses the trade services sector. Uh, so that is electricians, plumbers, uh, fire companies, HVAC, and we're basically what you would call an operational ERP system, which means we, we run basically all of back of house and front of house, uh, but the one thing we don't do is the financials or the general ledger. Uh, and that means it's a very large monolithic application. 
Uh, and at any point during the day uh, this year, you know, we could have up to 130,000 odd users online using the system at any one time. So uh, it's certainly a well uh, stress tested environment um, and FreeBSD is, uh, is, is a big part of that. So where did we start? I joined Simpro in 2011. Um, and it took me a while to sort of, I guess, get under the bonnet and work out what was going on. I joined Simpro as CTO. So whilst my role now at Simpro is COO, Chief Operating Officer, I was CTO for the business up until about a year ago. Uh, and so I served in that role for almost nine years. Uh, when I joined, it was a very small business. We had five devs, one sysadmin. Uh, about 300 clients, mainly in Australia, uh, and 17 co-located servers that were running all of that in one data centre. Uh, it was a fairly traditional LAMP stack, and it was actually using a mix of Linux distros because the, uh, uh, the sysadmin prior to my arrival basically installed the distro uh, on the server at the time that he was uh, you know, having a play with, and that became the production environment, so fairly messy. I had some fairly major load and scalability issues because the way the system had been architected was basically groups of clients were just put on one server. Um, and there was no failover uh, and you know, there was no balancing, I guess, of clients across the infrastructure. And they also had a patching and upgrade nightmare. They couldn't automate any of it because they were running uh, two or three different versions of Linux and they also happened to be different, uh, you know, different stages of the life cycle in each. So you didn't necessarily have the same version of Ubuntu uh, running from machine to machine. So what we went through was a process to assess what we needed to do to get things right. Uh, yes, we were a small Australian SaaS company at that point, uh, but we had grand plans and uh, that meant we wanted to service clients in other countries. And before we wanted to go ahead and start that process, we wanted to try and sort out our stack and our operations at the engineering level to make sure we could um, you know, start scaling into uh, other countries, but also distribute access to the application. And that was really something that was a focus for us. There was no point, for example, trying to service clients in the UK um, out of a data center in Australia. Uh, it's still 400 milliseconds odd to get from the UK to Australia. So responsiveness of an application across that sort of time frame uh, is pretty poor. So scalability and distribution was key. Uh, the next thing we wanted to address were all the performance bottlenecks we were seeing. Uh, we also wanted to make sure we had a good maintenance and upgrade path because that had been an ongoing issue. I talked around patches, et cetera. Um, and we wanted to build ourselves a system that meant that we could scale horizontally over time and try and reduce the requirement on us to have maintenance windows. We also wanted to counter some what we thought might be licensing issues, particularly for those of you who know the, uh, the GPL or the LGPL or the AGPL. Uh, some of the things we were starting to see come through in those licenses were becoming concerning particularly if you are using uh, open source software within your SaaS application and charging for it. Um, now, I don't think that's necessarily become a massive issue today, uh, but we were sort of certainly countering for what could have been an issue. The other thing we were also assessing was, did we have the right application architecture? Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and of course, we kept cost as a focus uh, because, you know, it's great to build out a great big system, but if it means you need 30 sysadmins to keep the thing running, then obviously that would be an issue for us as well. FYI, guys, before I go on, I'm uh, not particularly precious. Uh, so if you want to uh, send through uh, any questions whilst we're talking uh, on something that sort of uh, piques your interest, more than happy to answer those as we go along. So obviously we had a LAMP stack. Uh, the considerations that we were making was, was MySQL the right database to stick with? Um, should, we, should we be looking at something more like Postgres, which was starting to have a comeback? Uh, Postgres was a consideration also because we were worried about the MySQL acquisition that was happening at the time and what that meant um, for use of MySQL long-term and licensing. 
Uh, we had seen a change in a lot of the admin tools in MySQL where they had become paid versus unpaid, et cetera. So that was a consideration as well. Uh, the web server, we were running Apache at the time, so we compared it with Lighty and Nginx. Now, let me just say, you're probably wondering where this leads to in the FreeBSD world. Well, you'll see very quickly how some of this decision-making process actually started to be very heavily influenced by the operating system. Um, so we'll get to that in a sec. So continuing on, storage scaling. Uh, we had no storage scaling at all. We had no replication in the current setup. Um, we were looking at how we could use either NFS or DRBD or RSync to get us some form of replication or scaling of storage. Uh, we looked at you know, whether we needed to uh, uh, include some traffic management and load balancing in the application uh, to help us scale, particularly if we wanted to move to say a multi-DC setup. Uh, and then we thought about, you know, maybe we needed to do a complete application rewrite. Now, <clears throat> large monolithic application, uh, over 3 million lines of PHP code. Uh, and I cough when I say that, and I know some of you will be shuddering as well. PHP is not my preferred language. Uh, I'm a Perl programmer by trade, uh, but the application was written in PHP uh, way back when. Uh, so I, I didn't really see that as an option, uh, particularly when we had started to build a dev team of purely PHP programs. Uh, and then the last consideration after we went through comparing all of these options was, did this mean we should look at the OS? I mean, obviously we wanted to move to one OS and the consideration was to move into one version of Linux and that was our plan. But as we went through evaluating the tools that we were going to run at the application layer, all of a sudden OS became important. This is a really interesting graph. Now this is from 2013. Uh, and this is why the OS discussion became so important. So we ran a comparison on the setup we had decided to go through with from a database, web server, uh, use of various tools on the server, um, and uh, using, for example, ZFS, which we had just discovered uh, and read some good things about. So we basically did a setup of what we had decided to go ahead with in terms of services. And then we deployed these on each of these operating systems and ran some bench tests. And it was pretty amazing what we saw. I mean, FreeBSD with ZFS was just so far off the charts, it wasn't funny. Um, and that alone probably actually made the decision for us, but there was actually one more that really consolidated it for us. Um, now, I know ZFS is also available under Linux these days, um, and, you know, I believe performs just as well. However, we did return and run these tests in 2017, I believe it was, or 2018, uh, to make sure we were still happy with our choices and we didn't want to make any changes. Um, and still FreeBSD with ZFS, particularly for Postgres, um, makes a massive difference. Um, you know, getting that, uh, that, uh, that read size and write size uh, right between Postgres and ZFS just means a massive gain in performance, particularly for us where the data sets are very large. ZFS also in turn has addressed a security issue for us, which was around encryption of data at rest and also encryption of data in use. Um, so that's certainly something to consider as well. But an interesting chart I thought you'd like to see there. The other thing we saw when we did this testing was uh, just pure performance across both network and IO. Uh, we think a lot of this, particularly at the web server level, came down to uh, virtual memory in some cases. Uh, but basically, we saw a massive boost in requests per second that we could get on the instance. Keep in mind, all of the hardware used here was identical. The only difference was the operating system set up uh, and the services loaded on top. The services loaded on top were also configured in exactly the same way. So the only difference here was the operating system. So you'll see here the requests per second were well and truly off the charts in comparison to the old setup. 
So we had achieved what we wanted there from a performance perspective. Um, and the concurrent requests were also off the charts. So we'd certainly blown that out of the water as well. Very happy with that result. And then just looking at the application itself. So obviously the last slide more around network performance in a lot of cases. Uh, but this slide is around the application performance, particularly startup of PHP, which can be quite slow. Um, previous startup time uh, used to be sort of above 100 milliseconds. Now we're running at about, I, I think it was about eight milliseconds. Um, and script execution time obviously had reduced dramatically as well. So some pretty serious performance gains we saw. So where did we end up in this stack? So we ended up on Postgres. Uh, we ended up using some memcache just for some acceleration of data between Postgres and the application itself. We ended up with uh, Lighty as the application server. Uh, and I believe at the moment we're in the process of looking at uh, replacing that with Nginx. We also ended up with ZFS and Unison. And you might recall a few minutes ago, I mentioned there, were, there was another consideration that really hit it out, out of the park for FreeBSD and Unison was it. Because when we were looking around how we were going to scale storage and how we were going to have, and this is a really important distinction for us. We didn't require at the application layer um, uh, in time synchronization of files. What we needed was basically eventual consistency of those file systems. So as long as everything was kind of in sync within say 30 to 60 minutes, that was good enough for us. And because we wanted to run geographically diverse um, data centers, that also counted for where we lost connectivity. So the application was able to keep running even if the file systems weren't consistent from data center to data center. Um, and it meant that we weren't putting a lot of pressure on trying to make sure we keep data centers up to date, you know, within, you know, two to three seconds of each other. And Unison actually addressed that. For those of you who haven't played with Unison in, uh, uh, in this sort of environment, it is a fantastic tool, uh, particularly for syncing file systems, syncing directories, but also where you have um, very large groups of servers that you want eventual consistency on. You can have Unison kind of run in a chained method where it will just go around over the course of 30 minutes and ensure that all of the file systems eventually become consistent. And for us, that works perfectly because we now have, uh, I believe over 40 application servers uh, with a basically what we call a shared file system, but they're not linked um, real time they are basically kept consistent by Unison. And it does mean that they degrade very nicely if there's an interruption to connectivity and don't affect the application running. So Unison obviously, you know, pretty cool for, for what we were doing. ZFS made all the difference to our Postgres performance. Uh, and that is, um, you know, just out of the park performance we get with Postgres on ZFS. It's also been particularly reliable. Uh, so considering now we're running uh, over 30 uh, Postgres clusters globally. Uh, so that's multiple Postgres instances, usually uh, front-ended by PG Pool. Uh, we have not had a single ZFS failure in the eight years we've been running it. Uh, and that's a real testament to ZFS under Postgres. Uh, we're also running HA proxy for traffic management and some load balancing, that's fairly common. And realistically, what we're getting now versus where we were is about four times the performance of the application to the users. And that makes a big difference. If every page load in a SaaS application is less than sort of 200 milliseconds, that's gold. Uh, that means the application is almost as fast as using an application on the desktop. Uh, and that's what we're, we're trying to get to. So why FreeBSD for us? A number of really good reasons you've already heard, but the consideration for us was also around the fact that FreeBSD is, you know, it's built for server world. Um, 
There is no tuning of the operating system or work on the kernel uh, that is being done to, to make it support a desktop environment. And we think that's a big difference between the performance we see with, uh, with uh, particularly IO and virtual memory under FreeBSD. Uh, that targeted approach to making sure it's the best that it can be in a server environment and is not having changes made to suit a desktop environment uh, really leads us to believe it's it's probably the best contender, well, was the best contender at the time and is still the best contender now. Um, we're also concerned that that focus uh, in other operating systems of having the system be able to work on, you know, desktops, tablets, TVs, um, removes the focus from it being a, a really good server environment. Um, but it also means that it's splintered I guess the, uh, the groups that are working on kernel versus services. Um, and you can, I, I guess this also comes down to the fact that, you know, FreeBSD is an OS, not just a kernel. Uh, and I know you've probably all heard that before, but that makes a big difference, right? If, if you're, you know, 100% guaranteed that everything that's being uh, pushed out as part of the operating system has been through that QA process um, from the maintainers, as averse to it being just a kernel and then everything else stacked on top, it makes a big difference. And it comes through in your reliability and uptime stats. Uh, the other big consideration for us was the upgrade process. Now, obviously we we're in a pretty poor position before we started uh, where, uh, you know, we had different versions of Linux, et cetera, that made it hard. Um, the timing of releases, I think, you know, Particularly, I guess, in other operating systems, there is a push to release faster and faster. Um, you know, the, the approach from FreeBSD of, uh, you know, a more, I guess, conservative approach to major releases certainly helps us in a business environment where we're not, uh, you know, having to upgrade all the time. Um, and it means basically less maintenance, more reliability, um, a, a, a lesser requirement for us on sysadmin staff. Um, and you'll see that in a sec. Config joy, config joy is a big one for me. So uh, for Linux, one of the concerns we had was we see a lot of fragmentation of configuration under Linux, um, or we saw it coming through at the time. Um, FreeBSD sticks to what the original package intended to have. So if it had one config file, it's still got one config file in FreeBSD. It hasn't been split out into a hundred different config files. Uh, Apache is probably a good example of where this has happened in a number of other operating systems. Um, and the other thing we particularly like about FreeBSD is the control we get from using syscontrol. Um, so we basically have about five or six uh, different um, uh, models that we run FreeBSD in. And most of that model is actually driven by the syscontrol file. Uh, and the configuration we apply there. So we can make it a you know, database specific instance versus a web server specific instance, uh, tweak all of the variables and syscontrol to make sure that it operates best for what it's serving. Uh, the other part for us is the ports collection. Obviously it makes uh, installing and updating um, you know, the applications and services we're running on top of the operating system a hell of a lot easier. ZFS and Unison we've talked about, so I won't cover that again. And then the other consideration that was, the, I guess, the final bit um, in, the, in the struggle for us on deciding was Linux binary support when needed. Um, and we did have a couple of applications that um, did not uh, run under FreeBSD and there was no port. Uh, however, uh, with binary support, uh, for Linux under FreeBSD, that meant we were able to migrate those applications uh, to our FreeBSD installation. And then over time, we actually replaced those applications with something more suitable. Uh, but that basically gave us a halfway house for those applications. And then the final bit, performance. I mean, you saw the stats, they were pretty clear to us. Um, I firmly believe, you know, combination of KQ and virtual memory management under uh, FreeBSD is, uh, is wholly responsible for that. And I know there's still lots of talk around why KQ is so great, uh, but certainly in our environments uh, and the services we're running, we see the benefits of both of those uh, big time on a day-to-day -day basis.
So where are we at today? Uh, and this will tell you a little bit about, you know, what's happened growth wise, but also what it's meant for our systems. Uh, we are 80 devs strong now, if you compare that to the five we had, uh, you know, at the start of the session, we only have three sysadmins. And that's really interesting. Uh, three sysadmins, 5,000 plus clients, it's actually 6,000 plus as of today. We've got 300 plus FreeBSD instances, I believe it's about 340 um, instances running globally across four data centers at the moment in production. Um, all managed by those three sysadmins and they are not highly stressed and they are not under the pump. Um, and the way we have things set up now, we are able to scale horizontally very nice across that, uh, that global data center footprint. Uh, we as a business are doing 40% growth and that means capacity planning uh, is a pretty important part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in engineering. Um, and we don't need to take uh, you know, major maintenance windows to do that. Uh, the combination of what we've done with, uh, with Postgres, with HA Proxy, with Unison in particular, means we are able to scale out horizontally very nicely without uh, having to have any maintenance impacts. Uh, and you know, the only maintenance windows now we tend to see are where they're imposed by the DC. Um, so you know, really a good result for us as a business uh, and, you know, the, the decisions we made uh, eight years ago are still living with us today and that we have no plan at this point to even change most of what we're doing simply because I think we got the decisions right at the time, uh, but the operating system and the tools that it supports for us uh, long term uh, give us a, a pretty clear insight that what we're doing now we can scale for probably the next five years without any major changes. Uh, so I think for us as a business, that's pretty exciting. Um, the fact that we, you know, have a small number of staff to administer all of this means a massive, uh, you know, uh, cost differential to what might have been the case otherwise. So that's it on the Simpro FreeBSD journey. Uh, happy to take any questions, guys. I'm sure there's some stuff there that, uh, that is of interest to you. Uh, so I'll keep an eye out for some questions now. I've actually got one in. How have you found the Linux binary support and is there anything you'd like to see improved there? Well, we actually had no issues with Linux binary support. Uh, it actually helped us a great deal. We, however, do not have any Linux binaries that we use now in our environment. We actually replaced all of those to get rid of it. Um, is there anything I'd like to see improved there? I'm probably not the best person to ask now, considering we don't ask, uh, we don't uh, run any of those anymore. But as I said, we were very happy with that. We had no issues with it, ran very well. What configuration orchestration management are you using? Uh, yeah, really good question. So interestingly, uh, being a Perl programmer, uh, at the time, very early on, there weren't a, a great number of tool sets around um, uh, to do a lot of this orchestration. There are now, so we are using uh, Puppet uh, and we are using some Jenkins as well in our business. But at the production level, um, a lot of the tools that handle the orchestration around um, um, bringing up instances, configuring instances, putting them into production is actually still based on some very original Perl scripts that I wrote um, eight years ago. So we actually built ourselves uh, a bit of an orchestration system to handle um, bringing on new database nodes, uh, new application servers. We are still using a lot of that today uh, and just slowly uh, sticking our toe into uh, or dipping our toe into the waters of other tools that have become available since. Next question, what are your current pain points with FreeBSD? Probably the one, I don't know that we necessarily have any current pain points. I know one pain point we had was we did have an issue uh, in our move from FreeBSD 10 to FreeBSD 11, where the upgrade path actually was broken. Uh, and we also had an issue with HA proxy 
uh, under FreeBSD 11.0, uh, and there was an incompatibility uh, or an issue created, I believe it was with virtual memory and HA proxy, and we had a, a, a pretty major issue there where basically our load balances were going offline uh, fairly regularly. However, when it was brought to the attention uh, of both the main FreeBSD maintainers and the HA proxy maintainers on the FreeBSD list, uh, that problem actually got addressed in less than 24 hours. Um, so whilst it was a pain point at the time, uh, the response was so quick um, that we were seriously impressed. Uh, other pain points at the moment, I don't think we really have any. We're actually, you know, we're, we're pretty solid at the moment. No other questions at this point. I don't see any other ones, um, but thank you very much, Jonathan. It was a very interesting talk. No problem at all, guys. Uh, more than happy to uh, to take any questions afterwards as well. I'm sure the um, um, the hosts uh, of this event will be more than happy to share my details and more than happy for them to do so if uh, anyone wants to do a deep dive. Oh. What version of FreeBSD are we using now? Sorry, one last question just came in. Uh, we are currently uh, on 11. Uh, and we're in the process of upgrading to 12 at the moment. I think we're about halfway there. All right, perfect. Thanks again, Jonathan. Um, I'm actually going to switch to Deb for a bit to give an update before we go into our next break. So let me do that. And Deb needs to turn her video on. Oh, there we go. Oh, and I have to click on the right person, even better. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very good, Deb. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, we, we had a little extra time here before our next break. And so I thought it would be nice to take you on a journey through our website on some of the, the resources that we have. Axel mentioned in his talk about you know how we can partner with commercial users more and promote uh, how they use FreeBSD and just how to increase the use of um, FreeBSD in general. So I'm going to share my screen here and let's see if I can find the right tab. I think this is it. Okay, so you should, I think, do you see my, um, yep. my screen now? Okay. And um, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to start here. So how much time do I have, John, so I can keep, I guess I'll just go like right 10 here. to 15 minutes or so. Okay, I, I'll, I won't take too much time. And people could post questions to here. So, uh, so here's our updated website. And what we try to do is add more helpful information on here. And so there's a couple of places where we do promote companies like, uses on how they use FreeBSD. So we have our testimonial page and we have quite a few uh, testimonials here and we're always adding here's Simpro who actually, um, I'm just making sure if anyone has any problems on my end. I've heard that my camera's frozen. Um, I see it, it looks fine to me. <laughs> as I scroll down, or is that also frozen? So you can see Simpro, Jonathan from Simpro, uh, who just gave his talk. They have a testimonial. So anyway, since this is a vendor summit that, and there are more vendors here, uh, please reach out to us. And if you haven't given us a testimonial yet, we would love to get one and publish it here. And we do promote them on social media too. And then the other thing that uh, I had mentioned in my talk yesterday, we just started with uh, case studies and we started with Mellanox and then the Netflix one is the one we just published and we did spend a little more time. The graphics on it and stuff and, and to make it a little more interesting and so you can see how 
you can see in PDF format or you can see this in, in sort of this book format. And we thought that this might be something we might print and hand out at conferences. And so we would love to add to our list. And if you are interested in working with us, uh, we do have a technical writer who will work with you and um, have the, the questions to help produce a high quality and informative case study. Then if you go to up here, hopefully you can see where I click under pre FreeBSD project and we have our FreeBSD resources page. And this is where we're adding more and more helpful information. It's getting started. And so we have the uh, FreeBSD installation guides. These are all how-to guides, so the various ways of installing FreeBSD, whether it's on a virtual machine or on your uh, bare metal system. We also have video guides. Uh, we don't have as many of those, but we're playing around with different ways of providing content. And um, let's see here. Uh, also, uh, we've had more projects, especially since the pandemic, we've been trying to add more content here. And so some more um, interesting, maybe more uh, you know, fun type of uh, projects to work on, like um, installing Minecraft or creating a Minecraft server on FreeBSD. And if you have any ideas of how to guides that you think would uh, be beneficial for us to provide, also give us some suggestions too. We do have a contractor who works with us part-time who writes up most of these for us. Roller Angel has been doing workshops around the world uh, with us and for us. And so we've created, taken his content and broken up his uh, instructions and set up and to do two different parts. And so that's, uh, those classes have been, or workshops have been really successful. And then we have uh, community resources down here where we've recognized different uh, people who put on, uh, you know, they have YouTube channels and they create content to promote FreeBSD. And so we've listed a few here. And if you have any other ones that you want to recommend, uh, please also, you could, you could add these to the question or you could put them in the Dev Summit channel. Uh, but we're out, but yeah, we, we can't always find all of them. And uh, and so we're always open to uh, learning about more out there. And then finally, there's two types of, um, well, here we have it listed as webinars and the FreeBSD Fridays is something that we started putting on uh, quite a few months ago. And if you go there, you'll see our schedule of upcoming talks or actually all the talks that we've given. And uh, and then links to the videos. So they've all been recorded. And, uh, and so here you can learn about well, hardware hacking with Raspberry Pi. That was a lot of fun with um, by Tom Jones and Jails by Michael Lucas and Cherry by Robert Watson. And so uh, all these great, interesting, informative talks. And coming up, we have next Friday will be uh, Detrace by Mark Johnson. And then uh, we have more talks that we're still trying to lock in for the rest of the year. And so this is a great way to, if you are from a company and you have employees who are interested in FreeBSD or, or you know, want to learn more about it, then these are a great introductory level talks. And then the other uh, webinar-ish type of thing happening is from the project side that they have office hours now every Wednesday. Well, I think it's every other Wednesday. And so you can see the, uh, the they started in April and uh, various different uh, talks that either, I mean, so these are more like how you would expect an office hour to be. So uh, it's very informal and you can ask questions or follow along depending on what the topic is. So these have been great too. And if you have any suggestions for webinars uh, or any uh, topics that you'd like to see in our FreeBSD Friday, we're always open to hear about that. Let's see, I see one question. We have a, 
So we have, so it looks like, so we come out with the, let's see here. I see when I open up, when I click on a link and it opens up a new tab that it's still being shared. So I'm gonna make that assumption here. And someone could correct me in the chat. Um, that if I go to our journal, that we have a testimonial uh, section in the next issue, and that'll be early next year. And um, sometimes, let's see here. There's I think journal. that'll be the, it's yeah, like a two it issues. It's like our January, February. So we have one coming out today, then we have another one that is it's, uh, the first one on, on for next year. We still so the previous D and research. Mm. I don't think we list the 2021 issues yet, but it would be a January oh, right. 2021 okay. as the one that uh, Tom is talking about. That's uh, case studies. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Good. So this was our FreeBSD journal, and you can access it from our website. This is how I got to it under our work, and then FreeBSD journal, and then it took you here. And I believe this is. Oh no, that's an older issue. Uh, I need like 20 minutes and I'll get it up yeah, there. Yeah, it's almost to there. Publish it. it's, almost it's, there. Ready. it's available. <laughs> so, and it's free. And, uh, and this is produced by a publisher. So it, it is something that the foundation funds. And uh, we have foundation members who help um, you know, oversee this effort of providing content. I believe John is the editor, is that right? Uh, chief editor? No, not editor. Um, from the editorial team. Yeah. I'm not an editor. Y'all are thankful that I'm not the editor. I'm, uh, we have professional editors who know what they're doing who edit the articles that go into the journal, not me. Thank goodness. Right. But John does. So you're the, um, I can't remember the title, but the, the, you're the chief person mm -hmm. on the editorial staff. We have an editorial board of, uh, it's many folks, it's not just me, um, who uh, kind of solicit authors and kind of brainstorm what our, our calendar is going to be of issue topics and so forth each year. Um, and I do serve on that board and have since the journal started, along with several other folks. I know um, George helped start, when we first started it, it was something that George really helped kind of drive and I was with him from the start of that because he was kind of the first chair of the editorial board. So. But there's a group of us that work on that. Um, and several of us meet along with folks in the foundation every year to kind of sketch out what is our annual schedule going to look like? What are the topics that we are, the things that are going on in FreeBSD that will be interesting to people? So it's a lot of people working to do that. And of course, we have people writing articles. It's not editorial board or not folks. We, we do write articles. I have an article, I think, in this upcoming issue. Um, but the goal is to have lots of people with that throughout the community contributing and writing articles and talking about what they're doing and how they're using FreeBSD. So like John said, the so um, one way that I participate is in that yearly editorial board meeting that happens typically at BSD CAN, uh, which is in Ottawa, and it's typically in June. And uh, so this year we actually did it over Zoom, and but one thing I found is it's, um, so we usually start the meeting at 8 p.m. And the whole reason is because the foundation has our annual board meeting that whole day. And so it gives us a little break in between going from this exhausting all day meeting to a two hour editorial board meeting that night. And so it does start at late and it usually goes from eight till 10 p.m. And, um, but everyone is, is really excited to be there and everyone is so passionate and the list of topics that come up for the um, upcoming, you know, well, it's usually at least a year out that the topics that people come up with um, are always really uh, interesting. And then we come up, we as a team, uh, come up with like what type of article should fit in, in those topics. And then we assign people to be in charge of, um, you know, who, who's going to write those articles. And then we, we try to assign people to um, keep, you know, keep to reach out to those potential authors and then keep on top of them. And so, but the thing that's um, always struck me at the meeting is that, that passion from this editorial board, because uh, I mean, they don't have to do those. They're all volunteers 
and a lot, yeah, and most people are, are really uh, tired <laughs> too. And so, uh, and maybe it's all the cookies that people yeah, like. I say the cookies. You're you're omitting <laughs> one of the key points in that meeting, which is that there's a usually there's about a ratio. I don't know. We end up with like a tray of cookies at the end because we normally can't quite eat all the cookies. But there's so many cookies you can eat in <laughs> one evening. So. <laughs> Um, I, we did get a question come in, um, are the FreeBSD Fridays recorded? And yes, they are. So you can go to that page that, so John, can you help me here? So when I, if I, uh, click on, uh, let's see here, but it's, well, I think the, it yeah. opens a new tab and does it stay there? Uh, I think we see your tabs, maybe. Oh, like, oh, well, you have a FreeBSD Fridays tab open that you could switch to, I see. Okay, so you see those, you see three tabs yeah, open, right? Tab, yeah. Okay, great. So it looks like it, it, it doesn't show all the tabs open. Um, yeah, just so, the I think. Just the ones I've opened since I've shared the screen or those. So let's see, here's the previous few Fridays. I'm gonna go to the top and you can click on, well, let's see, click on one introduction to FreeBSD that I gave at the first session. And there it is. It's so you can you will be able to watch this. It's on YouTube. And all of the FreeBSD Fridays, um, along with office hours and even to, like the streams from the summit um, today, they're all on the FreeBSD Projects YouTube channel. So like the dev has the link right there on, on your screen. The FreeBSD Projects YouTube channel will have all of these as well. Um, that you can find there. So if you have a smart TV app and you're want some something, you know something to put you to sleep at night, maybe. Um, you can pull up YouTube app on your TV and, even, and find talks that way. So subscribe to our channel. That way you can get more cool stuff on your TV. Right. And, and it's really, uh, you know, we're trying to, we, the foundation, as well as the project and the community are trying to provide more content to reach out to people around the world. And, uh, and so that's why we're really interested in hearing from you on what kind of content would be valuable and interesting to you so that we could uh, help provide that or someone from the community may be interested in, in doing that. So, um, and, and I think it's, it, it's fun for certain people who are stuck at home, <laughs> sort of an outlet to the world. So I think that's really all I have. Well, I, I can take you here to our, our donate page and just remind you that we're hundred percent funded by donations and uh, we are in the U.S. We tend to get into fundraising season at the end of the year, and I think it all is because it is a tax write-off, typically for U.S. citizens, and um, and so I'm sure that that's why it revolves around there. But uh, but we are kicking off our fundraising season. We do uh, fundraise throughout the year, and you can look at our fundraising page at what we've who's donated so far. Um, but I'd like to ask everyone to consider uh, making a donation to, to us to help us uh, with our efforts for next year. And, and I did go over or list some of those things that we're looking at working on for next year.